Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of psychiatric and CNS drugs. This is recording part two. Now we're going to talk about antipsychotic drugs, also called neuroleptic drugs. These drugs are most commonly used in the treatment of schizophrenia, which is a psychotic disorder, also sometimes used in bipolar disorder, which is manic depressive disorder. There are many drugs in, these, in this class, including chlorpromazine, which is thorazine, clozapine, which is clozaril, haloperidol, which is haldol, risperidone, which is risperidol, and droperidol. These drugs block dopamine receptors, and that's very important for you to remember. Side effects of these drugs usually have to do with dopamine and its effect on movement. EPS, extrapyramidal side effects, refer to any sort of movement disorders, and they occur with all of these neuroleptic drugs except perhaps clozapine. Examples of extrapyramidal effects include tardive dyskinesia, which is abnormal and involuntary movements of the face, neck, and tongue, acute dystonic reaction, which is an acute episode of muscle rigidity or cramping in the face, neck, or tongue, and can include the larynx, which would lead to airway compromise. These are treated, this would be treated with diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, or benztropine, which is cogentin. And even though this is an antihistamine, we're really primarily interested in the anticholinergic effect. That's what helps treat these movement disorders. Patients can also have Parkinsonism, which is rigidity, tremor, and decreased movements, or akathisia, which is a generalized restlessness. Another side effect is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS. This presents as hyperthermia, muscular hypertonicity, autonomic instability, and mental status changes. You can see it looks a lot like malignant hyperthermia. Patients may have rigidity that is so severe they need ventilatory support, and they can have myonecrosis and muscle breakdown, which leads to renal failure. The incidence is relatively low, 0.5 to 1%, but it carries a 20 to 30 percent mortality. The treatment for NMS is dantrolene, actually, the same as MH, or amantadine or bromocryptine, which are dopamine agonists to offset the dopamine antagonism. If you're ever concerned that you may have NMS and want to distinguish it from MH, one thing that may be helpful is knowing that non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs will cause flaccid paralysis in NMS, but not in MH. More common side effects that we need to know about in neuroleptic drugs. Cardiovascular effects. So we see alpha blockade, which leads to orthostatic hypotension. We see prolonged QTC interval, which can lead to ventricular tachycardia or torsade. And this is the reason why droperidol was taken off the market, because of this very concern. In the endocrine system, Antipsychotic drugs block the inhibition of prolactin, which leads to galacteria and gynecomastia in men as well as women. Patients have a decreased release of corticotropin, which means they have decreased corticosteroids. They develop weight gain and hyperglycemia. These drugs are sedating. They are antiemetic, and we use them for that advantage in the perioperative setting. And droperidol in particular can have a dysphoric response, a very unpleasant sensation that patients have when they receive this drug. Clozapine can also cause agranulocytosis. Many of these drugs can potentiate the activity of opioids. Moving on now to anti-epileptic drugs. And before we get into these drugs, we should just clarify that if a patient is having a seizure and you want to stop it as quickly as possible, the drugs that act quickly are barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and propofol. Obviously, you need to consider the side effects of these drugs and whether they're appropriate for the setting that you're in, but these are drugs that will stop a seizure quickly. Now, phenytoin, or dilantin, works by blocking sodium channels. It blocks other channels as, too, but we'll focus, other channels as well, but we'll focus on sodium channels here. Phenytoin is about 90% protein bound, which means that if a patient has low albumin levels, they may have an excess of free drug. This is important because the therapeutic level at 10 to 20 mics per mil is right up against the toxic level, which is above 20 mics per mil. Many drugs can increase or decrease 
phenytoin levels. And to make things even more complicated, phenytoin is metabolized with zero order kinetics at higher plasma levels. So we can see dramatic changes from underdosed to properly dosed to toxicity with small changes in patient's homeostasis. For that reason, we often check a phenytoin serum level when there's any question about a patient's status. Side effects of phenytoin include nystagmus, ataxia, nausea and vomiting, hypotension, gingival hyperplasia, and it's also teratogenic and should not be used during pregnancy. Phenytoin toxicity manifests as respiratory distress, encephalopathy, encephalopathy, tremor, hallucinations, movement disorders, and arrhythmia. The normal dose is 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram, which usually comes out to about 1,000 milligrams. Because of its sodium blocking properties, you may need higher doses of non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs. It needs to be given slowly, less than 50 milligrams per minute, or patients will develop significant hypotension. Also, phenytoin should not be mixed with other drugs in the same IV line, or it will precipitate and block the IV line or the catheter. There's also a drug called phosphenytoin, or prodilantin. It's the, pre it's the metabolic precursor to phenytoin. You give it, and then it converts to phenytoin in the body. One advantage is that you can infuse this drug more quickly without developing the same hypotension. Probably the most common anti-epileptic drug that we're using in the perioperative period is levetiracetam, or Keppra. It has an unclear mechanism of action. The dose is between 500 and 1500 milligrams, either IV or PO, twice a day. It has very few significant side effects, no hepatic metabolism, minimal protein binding, and is excreted in the urine, and so dosing should be decreased in patients with renal disease. Lacosamide, or Vimpat, is a drug often used in combination with other anti-epileptic drugs. We also see it used sometimes in chronic pain. The drug works by enhancing the slow inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels without affecting the fast inactivation. Basically, it prevents the channel from opening and helps end the action potential. So this is a drug that slows excitability in the central nervous system in order to decrease seizures. Three other drugs that you may hear about. Carbamazepine, or Tegretol, which is used not only for epilepsy, but for neuropathic pain, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. It works by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels. It's also a GABA receptor agonist and a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It has some rare but serious risks, including aplastic anemia, agranulocytosis, SIADH, and hyponatremia. And it induces the cytochrome P450 family, which will increase clearance of many drugs. Valproic acid, also called valproate or divalproex, or Depakote, is used for epilepsy, bipolar disorder, and migraine headaches. It works by blocking these voltage-gated sodium channels, and it increases levels of GABA. Serious side effects include low platelets, liver toxicity, pancreatitis, and birth defects. Lamotrigine, or Lamictal, is used for treatment of epilepsy, bipolar disorder, depression, and headaches. Once again, blocking voltage-gated sodium channels and increased action of GABA. Serious side effects include skin reactions and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Now, gabapentin, or Neurontin, is a drug you will see commonly. It was originally designed for epilepsy, but now it's mostly used in the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain or diabetic neuropathy. It interacts with voltage-gated calcium channels and NMDA receptors. The drug has to be dosed several times a day, often three or four times a day. Common side effects, especially at higher doses, are dizziness, drowsiness, and memory loss. It has no protein binding and no hepatic metabolism. Another drug, which sounds similar but acts differently, is called pregabalin or Lyrica, also an anti-epileptic drug used commonly for neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia. It seems to work by increasing GABA activity. Now we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease, which is a degenerative CNS disorder. It's due to insufficient dopamine formation in the brain. As a result, patients develop 
movement disorders similar to what we talked about as side effects of neuroleptic drugs. Patients have tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement. Later on, they develop autonomic dysfunction and dementia. And as you can imagine, dopamine antagonists can worsen Parkinson's syndrome symptoms. So we want to avoid not only haloperidol, droperidol, but other dopamine antagonists like metoclopramide, which is Reglan, and promethazine, which is Phenergan. One of the most common drugs in the treatment of Parkinson's disease is levodopa, or Cinemet. Levodopa is a dopamine precursor. It can cross the blood-brain barrier, unlike dopamine. So if we want to replenish a patient's diminished dopamine in their brain, we can't just give them a pill or an IV infusion because it won't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we give them levodopa, which crosses the blood-brain barrier. When it gets there, dopa decarboxylase will convert it to dopamine. Usually when we give levodopa, we give it together with carbidopa. Carbidopa prevents dopa decarboxylase from converting the levodopa to dopamine before it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And ingeniously, the levodopa is able to cross the blood-brain barrier, but the carbidopa cannot. So this keeps the levodopa protected until it crosses the blood-brain barrier, at which point the patient's dopa decarboxylase will convert it to dopamine. Side effects include hypotension, especially orthostatic hypotension. And most patients who are on these drugs depend on them. And abruptly, ses uh, abruptly stopping these drugs can cause Parkinsonian syndromes and NMS. Since these drugs are often taken sev several times a day, I always ask the patients, when was your last dose and what happens if you miss a dose? Because otherwise you may find yourself redosing this drug intraoperatively or worse postoperatively through an NG tube. There are other treatments for Parkinson's disease, like dopamine agonists, such as bromocryptine or pergolide, anticholinergic drugs like benztropine, which restores the balance between acetylcholine and dopamine. This helps a lot with the trevor, tremor and the salivation, although doesn't help much with the rigidity. The antiviral medication amantadine may also help facilitate dopamine release and delay reuptake. And finally, the MAOB inhibitor selegiline may be helpful. That wraps up our discussion today. Please let me know if you have any questions.